Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the University of Central Arkansas Society of Physics Students 2015-2016 seminar series. Uh, this seminar series is supported by the University of Central Arkansas Department of Physics and Astronomy and the University of Central Arkansas uh, Foundation. Um, you can reach me at my Twitter handle at WSLATON or my email address WVSLATON at UCA.edu if you would like to participate in the seminar. We're currently joined by uh, Suffolk University. They are located in uh, Boston. I'd love to have many more students joining us from across the country. So if you're interested, please let me know. We are excited to have with us Dr. Sarah Tuttle. Uh, she received her BS in physics from the University of California at Santa Cruz. She went on to earn her PhD in astronomy from uh, Columbia University. She then was a postdoc research scientist at UT Austin and most recently is a research, research associate at the McDonnell Observatory there at UT Austin. She's going to be giving us a, a seminar on building an instrument to discover dark energy and I am excited to learn about this. Uh, so take it away, Dr. Tuttle. Fantastic. Thank you. Let me get us started. There you go. All right. So my name is Sarah, and I'm going to be talking today about detecting dark energy, or the entire universe in very short order. Um, I have a few slides that require shouting. I know some of you will probably be muted, but feel free to shout them out, and I'll, I'll make some guesstimates to move on. You know, there's some, some adjustment, but when I'm so far away, it's a little trickier to make sure that, uh, that you're still engaged with what is an interesting and somewhat obtuse topic. So, you know, shout. I'll probably hear you, or I'll just imagine it, which will also be entertaining. All right, so first shouting slide, what is the universe made of? When you, when you think about the contents of the universe, what do you usually think of? Matter! matter. Oh, good, yes, fantastic, matter. So here I have some, some demonstrations of matter. Um, you can see gas and stars, different molecules, also swans. There's lots of things that we think about that we interact with on a daily basis. So we think, you know, when I think about my day, I could make a long list of, you know, various materials that are, that are part of um, what's out in the world. Now, when we actually take a step back and do this for the entire universe, not just the universe that we interact with, what we find is most of the universe, in fact, is made of something somewhat mysterious called dark energy. So when we look at all the different techniques that we use to weigh the universe through all of time, we find that 68% of the universe is dark energy. That leaves us with still a not insignificant fraction, more than 30%, but out of that remaining portion, 27% is dark matter. Dark matter is something that we'll talk about just a little bit that we are able to measure, but we still don't actually know what dark matter is. So it interacts with some, some things. It interacts sort of at the galaxy scale, but we're not actually able to put our hands on it. There's still theories. It's still outstanding what, what dark matter is. So that leaves us about 5% um, for otters and everything else. OK. We're going to play a game, very briefly, called Dark Matter or Dark Energy. Part of why I do this is because astronomers are really terrible namers, uh, and we've gone and named Dark Matter and Dark Energy in a way, honestly, that I think is a little bit confusing. Um, because actually, except for the fact that we don't really know what we're talking about, and obviously they dominate the, the energy budget, we, they're not related in sort of that very fundamental sense. So I'm going to put up some slides, and then you guys are going to shout out if you think that they're dark matter or dark energy that's being displayed. All right, first one. You can guess, because I can't see you. There's no penalty. Dark energy. Yeah, dark energy. Dark energy. What is energy? I love guessing. Good. No, this is dark matter. <laughs> this is dark. I know. I'm so sorry. Right out of the gate. This is a cluster of galaxies called Abel 520. 
And what you're seeing here is overlaid a, a variety of multi-wavelength data. So there's galaxies, and it's a galaxy cluster. There's also hot gas. So the orange that you're seeing is starlight. The greenish gas, you can kind of see it dancing on the top in the middle there. That green gas is from X-rays, from a space observatory called Chandra. And so that's hot, hot gas. And we know that there's hot gas in galaxy clusters. It's kind of um, out in a halo. And the blue gas, or the blue kind of mistiness, is actually a gra is, is a dark matter. It's, this has been measured through gravitational lensing. And I'll show a diagram a little bit later of how that works. But so that's sort of where we know the dark matter is, even if we're not exactly sure what it is. And that actually is measured uh, using Hubble. OK, here's another one. We've got a person in a clean room suit, dark matter or dark energy. Matter. I know you've been burned before. This is also, this is for detecting dark matter. Uh, it's, a, it's called Lux Zeppelin. And Lux is actually trying to measure what dark matter is. So there, this is way underground in um, something called the Homestake Mine. And they're trying to measure if WIMPs, which are weakly interacting massive particles, are what dark matter is. All right, dark matter or dark energy. 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 Oh, I like it. We're starting to split. Dissension in the ranks. This is actually, this is the simulation experiment used to measure dark matter that we were looking at before. So here you can see a particle is actually being impacted in xenon gas uh, and then is scintillating. So it's breaking apart like that through the gas and then it's lighting up the detector. Okay, one more. Dark matter or dark energy. Dark energy. Oh, you're so, you're so I appreciate how brave you are. No, this is still dark matter. <laughs> I, I know. It's rough. At least you have pizza. So it'll be okay. So this is, and I'm going to go back and forth between two slides here because I think it helps. So this is the image. Um, this is another galaxy cluster. And this is actually the visualization of the concentration of dark matter. I know. The universe is kind of cool. So dark matter is invisible, but it's a distorting light around it. So you can imagine there's sort of a lump of stuff in space, and it's actually light from galaxies way behind the cluster are being bent all the way around. And we're able to use those measurements of those galaxies to actually model what the dark matter distribution looks like. Um, and here's, I think, a helpful graphic so you can see I sort of, I always love the like rubber sheet being depressed in the universe. So you can see there that distortion in the center where the galaxy cluster is. Light at the back is coming from a galaxy and it's actually kind of running around the galaxy cluster. So when we're able to measure those distorted galaxy images, we can then, or those lensed galaxy images, we can then model that dark matter even though when we just look at the photons that are emitted, we don't see nearly as much matter as the gravity tells us is there. So this is not the only way that we measure um, dark matter. Oh, you know what I just realized? You're all going to have a laugh. Hold on. My computer is set to fade as the sun sets. Uh -huh. you're, everything's going to go yellow, and you're going to be like, that's distressing. <laughs> but it happens slowly, you know, but still it would be sad. That's thank you, daylight savings time. So here you can also see another way that we measure dark matter using rotation curves in spiral galaxies. So again, if, if you make an assumption that matter is, is mostly what we see, so let's say stars and gas that are emitting photons, a way that you might try to weigh a galaxy is to measure all of that light matter. And I'm, you can't see my air quotes, but there are air quotes, right? Things that are emitting in the way that we're used to. You might measure that, and then you might see, as you go further and further out in a galaxy, what the orbital velocity is. You might expect, as you go further out, and like just looking at this spiral galaxy, there's just less stuff on the outskirts of the galaxy. So less stuff in gravity, you would expect that the velocity would drop off. But what we actually observe is that the velocity doesn't drop off at all. Which, when that was first discovered, was a, like, was a woe. 
was that everyone must be doing something wrong. We thought we understood physics. We clearly are not. So these are just different ways that we're able to measure dark matter and that we're trying to understand what the particles are. But again, we have a pretty good idea at least how dark matter interacts. Now we're going to talk about dark energy, which we super have no idea about. In fact, dark energy is really a placeholder for saying big physics are happening in cosmology, and we're still trying to understand the underlying physical motivations that, that cause the behavior that we see. Now, I say that, but I also want to tell you, we definitely are not just making things up. We're right. making stuff up with observations. We're inspired. That's right, we're inspired by the universe. So here, although it's slightly, maybe not the most exciting plot, this is just to demonstrate that there are a number of different ways that we try to understand cosmology. So cosmology is just, you know, what's the history of the universe? What are the underlying laws that govern how things happen on large scales in particular? So here, each different band, so we have kind of the green stripe, the orange conish thing, and the we're going to call it a blue blob. These are each areas um, representing different experiments. So CMB is the cosmic microwave background, SNE is the supernovae, and BAO are, bac are baryon acoustic oscillations. These are all different experiments that tell us different parts of the puzzle to understand cosmology and that lead us to think that dark energy, although we're not sure what it is, is an extremely dominant force in our universe at this time. I put up Nobel Prizes since, you know, I'm unlikely to ever see one, so I figure if I give a talk with a Nobel Prize, it's at least, you know, a little morale boost. <laughs> also, just to recognize that a lot of this, you know, it's it's been recognized as big work, and, and it certainly is kind of on the cutting edge of how we understand the universe today. So first of all, this is just an introduction to the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background is sometimes called the baby picture of the universe. And roughly, it is just um, kind of the, after the Big Bang, right, you can't quite observe back to the Big Bang, but this is residual heat from the Big Bang that's radiating at about 2.7 Kelvin. So this is just a heat signature across the entire sky. This is a signal that you can observe, especially if you have an old tube television. It's about 1% of the noise that you see on your television. So it's being incident all over us, running into stuff. Um, so radiation from the Big Bang is all around us. And interestingly, this was, um, this was predicted uh, in the late 60s. And, and the first people to discover it and then win the Nobel Prize were not looking for it. In fact, they were trying to do some other work with a radio telescope in New Jersey, and they were really, really frustrated because they were trying to get this, they were trying to get the noise floor very low. They were trying to detect something that was very sensitive, and they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't get the telescope to work. It was an old radio dish. They tried everything. There was still the signal. They started to get kind of irate. Eventually, they went and there were pigeons living in the radio dish. And so they had to go, they chased out the pigeons. I hear there may have been shotguns involved. Um, they scrubbed out the pigeon poop. And you know, this was after they shook all the cables. And the signal was still there. And eventually, they, they met up with someone on the other side of town who had actually predicted this signal coming from the cosmic microwave background. So inadvertently, um, although it wasn't what they were looking for, they went and won a Nobel Prize uh, right, right from under. Uh, under the noses of the theoreticians, which I'm sure they were thrilled about. <laughs> so once we knew it was out there, um, we started sending satellites up. So COBE in the 90s went up to make this measurement, and that led to this XKCD cartoon. Part of why COBE, the COBE result was so exciting was that, and in fact this cartoon is just you know a, a drawing of a plot, but what's interesting about that plot is those data points actually have error bars on them, but the error bars are so small that you cannot see them for the line that is that is plotted over them um, to match the theory. So that was very exciting uh, to see that theory be accurately reflected in the measurements. But what we do see, so COBE and then WMAP and Planck are experiments that 
um, have have refined the the scale. So you can see as we take a step through those satellites, we're able to see at smaller and smaller scales. And interestingly, we actually see that the cosmic microwave background is not flat. So if the universe were all radiating at one temperature, then that would sort of be an interesting but maybe slightly surprising result because actually the universe is quite clumpy. Galaxies are in clusters. The way that matter kind of has evolved has led to a pretty chunky voids and clusters universe. Uh, and so there's, it is thought that a lot of that structure is actually reflected in those small scales of the cosmic microwave background. So then, from the cosmic microwave background, we're able to do some, some um, we have some evidence that the universe is actually expanding. So the Big Bang happened, and since the Big Bang happened, everything was kind of being blown outward. Okay, so it took some time, but people got on board with this idea of a universe that was moving away from itself or from everything in it. Then people went to confirm this using supernovae. So supernovae, in particular type 1a supernovae, are exploding stars, and these exploding stars are what we call standardizable candles, which is a little bit awkward. The idea of a standard candle is just the idea that you have something with a particular brightness, you know the brightness, and then when you measure it, you can use the knowledge of the brightness to know how far away that thing is. So you can just think about taking a 100 watt light bulb, it always is a 100 watt light bulb, and if you take it a mile away or 10 feet away, the brightness scales depending on, on that distance. So standardizable candles, or type 1a supernova, behave in a similar way. We don't actually understand what the progenitors are of type 1a supernovae, and it's an area of a great deal of research and certainly no small contention. However, we're able to calibrate them and use them to measure distance with limitations because, of course, we can't find things that are infinitely faint in space. So where the cosmic microwave background is something that's very far back at the beginning of time, supernovae we're measuring fairly locally. Um, we get better all the time at measuring supernovae that are further and further away, but it has we, we can't go kind of infinitely far back. So what you're looking at at the plot here is, um, and as it's labeled, it's bright to faint from top from bottom to top, um, and it's matching the supernovae observations with uh, different cosmological models. And what these measurements of supernovae, and these were actually done by several groups, one of whom recently won a Nobel Prize, what what they found was that the expanding universe model was not adequate. And instead, they found that the universe needed to be expanding, but also was accelerating, which then becomes a really weird thing to think about. Wrapping your head around the idea of an expanding universe is weird enough. Having a universe which expands and then is expanding faster and faster all the time it's just strange, and it's particularly strange because we don't have an obvious physical explanation for why that might be. Now, sometimes we talk about um, imagining a balloon. So we tr when we talk about centralist expansion, we'll often take a balloon and draw galaxies or something on it, and then you blow it up, and of course all the galaxies are on a surface, but they're moving away from each other. Truly, it's not a great example, only because trying to imagine the universe expanding and then accelerating is just a strange thing to wrap your head around. So I have a few different slides just to try to have some different visuals for you to imagine what it means that our universe is expanding and accelerating. So this way, we're sort of looking at a cut through. You can see the Big Bang. Now, a decelerating universe makes a little bit of sense. If you have the Big Bang and you think about the universe being predominantly what we'll call normal matter, so regular dark matter and standard otters, you have a big explosion, so there's a lot of force there, and that you know it's moving everything away from everything else. But of course, there's not a driving force. So over time, you would expect there to be a slowing. So in that model, you could see here, you might get kind of this turning in, or you might just get something that continues on less and less all the time. You could also imagine a coasting universe where things are kind of moving towards infinite openness. But instead, what we see is this kind of diverging acceleration, where things are truly being either pulled apart or pushing themselves apart. 
So this is why sometimes people talk about a vacuum energy, that maybe there's something that we don't understand outside of the universe that's pulling us apart. Here's another way of looking at it. So there's time along the x-axis at the bottom, um, the scale of the universe, so things getting further apart or growing on the y-axis, and then the Big Bang, which is always sort of adorably demonstrated, kind of like a sun. It's not clear. So in early days after the Big Bang, the universe was what we'll call matter-dominated. So it behaved in the way that you would imagine kind of an average matter place would behave. It was decelerating. So during this matter-dominated time, dark matter in particular was, was the dominant force, and things were expanding but slowing. Then there's this inflection point, you can see here a marked acceleration that happened at a time before now, where that actually changed and where things started to accelerate. So this is particularly strange. Something, so, so perhaps it had to do with the way things started at the beginning, and there was a reason for that inflection point, like things were of a certain scale, but something changed, and now we live in what we call an energy-dominated universe. And when we say energy here, we mean dark energy. So in present day, we're living in this energy-dominated universe that is accelerating everything apart. This is another nice way to look at it. Um, so towards the beginning, we had this dark matter and dark energy kind of in a tug of war. Dark matter is kind of winning. You reach a little bit of a balance, but dark energy becomes the dominant force. And now dark energy is wildly dominant over any matter in the universe. Okay, so how do we figure that out? Because again, people have worked on this problem for a while, and in fact even uh, Einstein suggested this idea of a cosmological constant a little bit late in his career, something which actually he greatly re re uh, regretted, but turns out may have been right, which is probably even the more irritating part. So there's a lot of theories. You know, theoretical physicists are everywhere. How do we figure it out? How do we decide which theory makes sense? Uh, and what the underlying physics are. So this may be generationally appropriate, but some of you may have played Guess Who, one of my personal favorites. And this is really just the idea, right? We're trying to match. We're kind of asking questions of the theory by making observations, and we're trying to see which theories make sense or get eliminated. So for example, earlier um, I referenced Planck, this satellite, and there's been a lot of contention actually around some of the measurements from Planck because they don't necessarily agree with past measurements. And in fact, the measurements that came from Planck managed to disqualify an entire set of theories. Um, so, so I had a peer who, after the results came out, I ran into him in the hallway and he was like, well, there goes those two years of work. Now, it's a little unusual that you sort of close off an entire arena of theory, but actually, you know, that's kind of what well-designed experiments do. They both open doors, but they also allow us to dismiss things um, that aren't, aren't correct. So here I've labeled some of the possible um, theories. There's really not only these theories, there are many more, and most of these theories have many flavors, if you will, um, of different ways that they could be tuned, for example. So here's this cosmological constant um, that Einstein suggested. People suggest actually modifying general relativity. So they say maybe maybe they don't have to have the same rules of gravity. Maybe, maybe it can be different um, on very, very large scales, or maybe things have changed with time, which is, you know, not how we like to think of physics, but a, a certainly a possibility. Um, there's this theory called quintessence, the holographic universe, there's all different ways that people are trying to solve this, this problem of expansion. It's also possible that, um, that perhaps some of the answers lie in the fact that we're really seeing that the cosmic microwave background is truly uh, not, not flat at all. And not only not flat, but not symmetric. So here you can actually see this feature called the cold spot. You can kind of see that bright blue in the lower right. That's a part of the sky that is, that is much, you know, much is not big on cosmological scales like this. These temperature scales are tiny. But you see a much colder patch in the sky. So there's some hope that, that understanding these anomalies that were, not, were mostly not predicted will give us information of the physics about why we're seeing this, um, this unusual force, if you will. So 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the experiment that I work on and what we're doing to try to understand and measure dark energy. So HETDEC stands for the Hobby Eberly Telescope Dark Energy Experiment. And HETDEX is um, being executed at the 10 meter uh, HET, which is the Hobby Eberly Telescope out in West Texas. It's about eight hours west of Austin. Um, and the only way to get there really is just to drive through the expanse that is Texas. Here you can see uh, a drawing. This is, in fact, I'm going out to the telescope in a week and a half, so we'll have an updated picture here. But this is a CAD drawing model of everything on the telescope once it gets modified. And in fact, actually, I'll go back for a second. So I'll be talking both about some of the science, but also you can see here there's these green cables running off the sides. Those are fiber optics that are taking the light from the telescope, and they're feeding them down the sides of the telescope into instruments called spectrographs, um, which I'm working on building, so I'll talk about those. Uh, and actually, although I won't talk about it a ton, but if you have questions, you can ask. The top half of the telescope has been completely removed and then completely rebuilt to give us a much larger field of view. So that means that we're able to collect many more galaxies while we take our data. So this is just another way to look at the history of the universe, if the history of the universe were a bell. So here you can see the CMB over to one side was sort of that blue and green like we were just looking at. So again, when we're looking at the this, this CMB, we're looking at um, these very early days. And there are other dark energy studies that are occurring right now, and many of those are happening much more locally. But with HECDEX, we're looking to actually measure where that yellow box is. Um, it's red shifts between 2 and 4. So part of why that time in space, so we're at red shift 0 now, um, part of why red shifts 2 to 4 are interesting one reason is because it's kind of the peak of star formation activity. So galaxies are very, very active, very efficiently forming stars. And you'll see later why that's helpful for our detection method. It's also interesting because that's kind of the time when we were seeing a handoff between um, this matter domination and energy domination. So we get much closer to that inflection point. And we actually get enough data that we're not just making a single measurement about dark energy. But we're actually looking to measure broadly. Um, we'll, sort of technically, we'll be able to make several bins, or colloquially, we'll be able to take several time points uh, throughout cosmic history to see if dark energy, kind of how that evolution might be happening. So I've used this word a bunch of times, and I'll try and explain it a little bit, because baryon acoustic oscillations are a little bit strange. Baryon acoustic oscillations are um, imprints in in the distribution of matter in the universe. And a way to visualize them, so I showed that cartoon that from the CMB that kind of just showed this nice curve kind of tailing off. Uh, in the tail of that plot that was not measured by that satellite but has been measured with um, as we've gotten better at making that measurement, we see these oscillations on different size scales. We see that matter and space are distorted and kind of have left this imprint. And so this is actually showing measurements of some of these, uh, these oscillations um, from WMAP as well as from the South Pole Telescope, another telescope um, unsurprisingly located at the South Pole, South Pole that's making measurements like this. So here you can kind of see the idea is by measuring galaxies, we're actually able to look back through time and measure that um, the distribution at the CMB, so kind of that unevenness at the CMB. A slightly more straightforward way to think about it is thinking about uh, netted Christmas lights. So you have lights that are kind of evenly distributed, but maybe can be distorted. So we use galaxies called Lyman alpha emitters. These galaxies are young. They're forming a lot of stars. And that means, and they're not huge, but they're pretty bright. And that means that they're emitting in a particular um, wavelength called Lyman alpha, which, if you were right next to it, emits in the ultraviolet. But because this light is being redshifted, it gets moved from the ultraviolet band pass all the way into the optical. So we're able to look for it on the ground, even though if we were right near that galaxy, we, you know, that light would be ultraviolet. So we'd have to be in space. 
So the idea is we look for these Lyman alpha emitters, and they're kind of scattered throughout the area that we're looking, and we actually measure their distribution. And we compare that distribution to models that allow us to look for distortions, so sh the changes in shape from flat in space-time. So we're looking for kind of things that are getting too bunched up or too pulled apart in different directions. So this is just demonstrating that. So we have kind of these intersections where galaxies are forming, and we're looking for distortions in space-time to try to measure the parameters of dark energy. Now, I can't fit 700,000 galaxies oops, on my screen, but we're looking for between 700,000 and a million Lyman alpha emitters um, between these redshifts of 1.9 to 3.5. We also end up with almost the same number of O2 emitters. So these are star-forming galaxies that are much, much closer to us. Those are very local. And we differentiate those using, um, using uh, an imaging survey. So when you look at them with an optical telescope nearby just imaging, it's very easy to tell if something is far away because then it's kind of a point source. Or if it's closer, we're able to see some of its galactic structure. We also see hundreds of thousands of other galaxies, many hundred thousand stars. Um, what you see here, the way that we conduct the survey is something called blind. We do a blind survey. That just means that we're kind of tiling the sky. We actually look in an area near the Big Dipper, as opposed to looking in a very particular, we're not like pointing at a particular set of galaxies that we already know are there. We're predicting the number of galaxies we'll get by using models for this kind of, of experiment. On the other side, the pictures, what you can see are the fibers that feed the telescope. So these squares with the light, you can kind of see the modeling there. There's almost 500 fibers in that, and each of those fills one of the green squares on the image underneath. So in fact, every time we take an image on the sky, we'll take about 35,000 spectra. So that's the split up wavelengths of the light. We'll take 35,000 spectra every time we turn the telescope on. Um, and then we'll take tiles across the sky. OK, so really this is my favorite part, is the hardware and the hitting things with wrenches. So we're building the instruments that do this work here um, at my lab in Texas. and. This is, I'll show you in a minute, this is not only a collaboration within my lab, we have several students, it's a collaboration over several continents and many, many institutions are involved. It's quite a large project. But here you can see one of the challenges, the way that we take all of these spectra, we're building 156 identical spectrographs. They end up in these units um, in the upper, whatever side that is for you, probably the right, with the silver and black box. That silver and black spectrograph is about 165 pounds. We'll have um, actually 78 of those units, and each of the channels, the front and the back there, are exactly the same. So those go onto the telescope, we cool them, and we use them to take data every night. It'll probably take about three years, in fact. Uh, and one of the exciting things about this project was we were able to kind of use this replicated technique, so we were able to kind of refine our processes and use um, less duct tape than traditional astronomical instruments employ. So again, this does not just happen with me. Um, here are, we've had a bunch of students rotate through lab. Here's actually not the most recent because the school year has started. I'll have to get an updated picture. Um, three of my students and my lab tech, who was a technician who stayed on. Um, this is a lab where we clean a lot of parts, we glue a lot of parts. Um, for doing something as high tech as trying to measure all of dark energy. Actually, much of it is extremely low tech. And although I said there's no duct tape, you can see we do have tape on the table there. So, you know, we didn't get away scot-free. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is what the spectrographs look like. This is nine of the 78 units. At this point, we actually have 53 of the 78 built. I have now annexed next um, I keep teasing people who go on sabbatical. If they go away for any period of time, I'm just going to put them in their labs. Uh, and they, won't, they won't know. It'll be fine. So, you know, again, one of the challenges here is just doing things correctly over and over again. Um, it's, it's always one of the challenges. And, and keeping track because they don't, you know, because of the way, you know, we're not a factory, obviously things happen 
a year or even two apart. And so making sure that you're reliable, that as procedures get handed off, it's not necessarily um, what we're best at in academia. So this is just to give you some idea of the scope of the infrastructure. So, you know, it's pretty easy to say, like, no pro well, it's, it's all much easier to say than to do. Um, but obviously, to install all of these spectrographs on the telescope requires a huge amount of infrastructure. So one of the biggest challenges was, um, you know, needing to put up all of, so the, the, the detector, so the way that we measure everything at the end, happens with CCD detectors. So CCDs charge couple devices. Um, to get them to a low noise state, they require to be cold. And by cold, it's like down at the kind of minus 100 degrees uh, Celsius. So to do that, we actually connect them to liquid nitrogen, which is pretty easy in the lab. But on the telescope, means we have to run huge kind of piping infrastructure. We have to run trucks up the mountain to fill a giant tank with liquid nitrogen. That all has to be distributed. So it turns out that was one of the biggest challenges, was just getting um, the health and safety, like the university health and safety, to sign off on us filling this enclosed dome with liquid nitrogen, which, if it leaks, nitrogen takes the place of oxygen and will kill you. Hmm. Turns out nobody likes to be killed, so you know you have to have some rules. Um, and we also, just things like, you can see here a drawing of the spectrographs in enclosures, so we build cabinets. Um, that are airtight, that allow us to control the temperature around the spectrographs, that allows us to make sure that um, mechanically things are stable. It keeps the air clean so we're not getting debris on the optics. Um, half of the spectrograph is enclosed in a vacuum, but the other half, it has like a plastic cover basically, but it's not under pressure particularly. So we have to cool the electronics. There's just a lot of different pieces that have to come together. So here you can see um, the those enclosures with a student at Texas A&M where those were built. So all of that had to be put together and now has been installed on the telescope. So next week we're actually heading out to install um, our first few units to do testing of that infrastructure to make everything make sure everything gets cold, all the electronics talk, that kind of thing. So it should be very exciting. So just in case you thought we were the only people doing this, which, you know, we're not, um, there are many experiments that are underway to try to measure dark energy. So again, it's kind of, you know, ironically, since we've already gone and issued a Nobel Prize in it, we really still just don't know what dark energy is. We've measured some of its behavior, but there's still a lot of work to be done to try to understand um, really what the underlying motive force is, if you will. And so a lot of different groups are working on it. Here are two of them. Um, the results at the top there with kind of the sunflower looking telescope uh, is EBOS, this Extended Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey. This is happening on the Sloan Telescope, which is a super cool piece of technology. I'm not sure you guys have had someone um, talk to you about Sloan yet. But it's a telescope based out in, uh, at APO in New Mexico at Apache Point Observatory. And Sloan is an interesting, um, as a project, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey initially went and, and just imaged a whole bunch of the sky. Um, they've taken spectra over a whole bunch of the sky. And it, it really changed the way in astronomy that, I mean, there, there are a variety of waypoints in this evolution. But Sloan has really made it so we're looking at large statistical samples of different kinds of galaxies, studying characteristics of classes of galaxies, rather than just collecting a small number of them um, that we're able to explicitly observe, say things that are very close to us. So in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, Sloan has really changed how people approach this kind of astrophysics. Um, there's always, I think, some balance back and forth between looking at individual cases and looking at statistical classes, but <clears throat> there have been some interesting evolutions in the way that we think about the universe through Sloan's kind of collection. Sloan is also interesting because uh, any of you can go online. So Sloan really pushed forward this idea of data should be accessible to everybody, and so you can go and dig in and, and study galaxies and try to um, you know, make your own experiments basically and pick through that data, and there's really spectacular both spectral data, so data that's looking at the um, 
individual wavelengths of different, say, stars and gas are emitting, uh, and imaging data so you can, you know, look for, for interesting galaxies that way. Um, and this bottom instrument is called the South Pole Telescope that we referenced earlier in data, and that, again, indeed, is just hanging out in Antarctica taking data. So there's a lot of different ways that people are trying to attack this dark energy problem, both locally and looking back um, at the cosmic microwave background, improving measurements of supernovae, uh, and trying to improve theories. So. Just to wrap up a little bit, because I figured we'd leave some time for you to have questions now that you're done with pizza. So dark energy, really, is a placeholder word that just means something is, is tweaking the universe. Something is changing the way that the universe is evolving in an unexpected way. And so for theory, theorists have come up with a large suite of theories. They're adding more all the time. But observers are equally trying to eliminate those theories and trying to improve our measurements to kind of close down some of those some of those options and really get to a place where we understand the message that dark energy is trying to send, where we understand, you know, is this a change to the underlying physics? Is this a force? Is this telling us something that's outside or inside the universe that we're not accounting for correctly? Um, so that's about all I've got here. And I figure this way, you guys can ask some questions if you have them. Wow. Well, let's give our speaker a round of applause. Cool. All right. I'm off screen sharing, but I can go back if you guys need to see slides again. OK. Um, quick question there at Suffolk. You guys got any questions? <laughs> I'm also good. If we think of one, we'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> okay, UCA, any questions? Jordan. So how do you guys quantify the expansion of the universe, and is it the same at every point in space? How do we quantify it? Let's see, I'm going to... So I don't echo at you. So, so, when we're trying to measure dark energy, what we're really talking about is constraining different pieces of the equation of state that describes all the different um, characteristics of dark energy. And so, I'm going to put a nail on the head there. By we don't really know what's happening at different times in the universe in different places. So one of the things that we tell ourselves and also tell you is that physics is the same at all points in time and space. But we don't actually know that that's true. I mean, it's easier to appreciate that that should be true just you know when we think about how the world works, but it turns out that it it's not clear. Sorry, of course, they're vacuuming. I think they vacuum once a month in my building. They're uh -huh. vacuuming right now outside my door, obviously. Um, so, so one of the reasons that kind of one experiment doesn't answer this question is because we really are trying to measure both at different points in time and space and also just in different ways. So we're using these Lyman alpha emitters. The distribution span biased in a particular way. We try to use different probes, so we might, you know, look for um, the distribution of gas. So, like, galaxies, it turns out, are particularly over-concentrated. They, they tend to gather together very strongly. When we look, for example, at, um, well, and in fact, this is when we look in models, because we haven't been able to detect this strongly yet, there is gas called the intergalactic medium that is kind of the cosmic web that galaxies are set inside. That gas is much less strongly biased, much less strongly um, clumped than galaxies. So if we could measure that, we expect that that might better be a tracer of, of the physics that's happening underneath the matter that we're used to. So you know, my expectation is that we still have maybe a whole other generation of experiments before we're really getting at the underlying physics of how that distortion might be occurring. Wow. Cool. 
Lucas. So I've done some work with uh, the spectra available at the Slow Digital Sky Survey. Um, and what, part of what we're doing is we're uh, correcting the spectra, we're starting with the base stuff and running the corrections themselves. One of the things that we have to correct is for uh, cosmic redshift. And so the cosmic redshift is basically just one way of representing the expansion of the universe, if I believe it correct. And so with these experiments, are we going to start getting different numbers for different galaxies? or you know, Because that's some of the stuff that's available. It's just kind of the accepted values of the cosmic redshift. So are we going to, as we look only at more and more, are we going to get different numbers for that? So you're yeah. asking, will the, will the redshift change if the, if the cosmological model changes? Yes, and if there's uh, different uh, redshifts for different regions or different galaxies. So, I, I mean, the, sh I mean the, sh the short answer is I don't expect you'd see a big difference, especially for the galaxies that you're probably looking at, which are, is it fair to guess they're pretty close? Or are you looking at higher redshift stuff? Um, we're looking at uh, yeah, Seeker Galaxies, I think is what it's called. At Seeker Galaxies, yeah. So, it is po so my, my guess is the cor any sort of corrections that we might see are not large. There's a, it's a slightly tricky question just in that getting the redshift correct can take some effort. Um, there are a lot of things that go in where you can't just, you know, look at an emission line and sort of count backwards and get it. There, there are already known effects that might distort, um, change that answer a little bit. I think certainly in the work that you're doing, I wouldn't expect that you would get big changes, but we certainly have, there are times in astronomy where the cosmological model has changed enough um, where those numbers do shift. Um, and there's some nice, actually, uh, who is it, Ned Wright, there's an online cosmology calculator, and so you can actually, without even kind of getting into the depths of it, you can tweak different values um, for, say, dark energy and for other cosmological uh, equation of state parameters, you can just see how it how it changes things, um, which is it's kind of a fun game to play. You can kind of see how far back in time different redshifts are, seeing how, um, you know, if you have, uh, there are different parameters like the Hubble constant, which until fairly recent actually, there were, there were groups in astronomy that thought those values were wildly divergent. And so that actually gives you quite different information when we try to do things like study galaxies that are external to our own. So you can kind of play that game and see when you make incorrect cosmological assumptions, what does that change? So in fact, usually when people write papers about galaxies, for example, they'll state at the beginning what the cosmology is that they're using. So if there are big changes, you can go back and, and kind of back out um, the data versus kind of the measurements that went in. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Question here, Sonic. Um, I was curious about the, the deceleration that was uh, observed after the Big Bang and then it started accelerating again. Is that um, like proof that that was due to causes from the Big Bang, or is it possible that it's going to decelerate again and then accelerate and just continue kind of a, a wave of deceleration and acceleration. Yeah, so that could happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's uh, is it weird to say it's really unnerving? It's really unnerving, but it's, um, in particular, so, you know, predictions for what could happen in the future are very much reliant on models. Because we don't have a good understanding of why this inversion occurred, um, it's it's not so hard. So I don't know off the top of my head if there is a model that kind of where you see that behavior. But there certainly are models, for example, where you see behavior where the universe does basically expand, accelerate and expand, and then eventually kind of collapse back down and then do the same kind of thing over and over again. So, so that is certainly um, a possibility. Obviously, it's on timescales that, you know, we're not going to observe, but it could be, and, you know, it's, it's a little tricky to predict in that way, but one could pretty easily imagine a model in which, in which that happened, in which we move back to a state of being matter-dominated, and which that either 
decelerated or sort of collapsed everything down, and then and then you kind of got a rebound in. I mean, the theories can get you can people have theories that involve our Big Bang not being the only Big Bang. So this it could just be happening over and over again. Um, you know, maybe we're like the fiftieth time or the thousandth time or the third time that you know stuff has crashed together and started again. Um, and so, you know, again, trying to, there's, there's a fine line, I, I don't know if anyone has talked to you guys about string theory, but you can sort of move off into this place where you, um, where you have a lot of different theories, but you have to figure out ways to observe them. So, like, there's some very cool ideas underlying cosmology, but then figuring out the place where you can actually measure and make predictions and check those predictions. You know, large-scale stuff is kind of a pain because... We can't like hang around and wait for a billion years and then see what happened. Um, so we have to figure out ways that we can sort of. I know it's pain. So we have to figure out ways to check either in like our recent past to predict or things that are happening on shorter time scales um, that might be predicted. Thanks. Yeah, it's a very. It seems like it's a very short view we have. It is a really short view. So could you explain a little bit more about um, the uh, baryonic uh, acoustic oscillations? How is those how are those oscillations or, or fluctuations going to be um, seen in when you look at the sky? What's so th they won't they won't be seen as images if that you know they'll they'll really be um, so so the word that I left out was, so when we think about supernovae as a standard candle, we think about the BAO as a standard ruler. So this idea of having a standardized length scale in the universe. Um, and, and so we use different ways of, of quantifying large-scale structure to try and measure that standard ruler. So large-scale structure, you know, again, when we start with the cosmic microwave background, um, there's this idea you know, we see the CMB, it's clustery, we look at galaxies throughout time, and, and they are also clustery, right? So we have clusters of galaxies, we have groups of galaxies, we look at, in our models of uh, a lambda cool dark matter universe, the way that things come together, we think, and we're working on observing, is in these filamentary structures of gas that connect throughout kind of all of the universe, so they're kind of collapsing down. Um, and, you know, it's not, <laughs> I, I wish it led to some sort of, like, brilliant image that would get shared, but the, at the end of the day, we're just trying to see, basically, if that predicted standard ruler is changing dimension. Um, mm. So by, by measuring kind of how far apart those galaxies are, both, you know, in projection as well as in depth, then, you know, we're kind of looking to see a distortion. So you can almost imagine, like, a ball, if it gets squished in one direction or the other, mm -hmm. then you're, you're able to constrain that dark energy parameter. Um, in this case, the one we're measuring is W. So it has a particular prediction, and we'll be able to see if that prediction um, is correct at redshifts of kind of 2, 3, and 4, basically. Um, and so it's... Yeah, it's a little bit, uh, it's, it's not the prettiest measurement. At the end of the day, the dark energy measurement ends up being like a dot on a point, mm -hmm. the really expensive dot on a point, uh, on a plot. And so, you know, it has to, I think the best, what we've seen, especially, you know, looking most recently at Planck, um, individual measurements of cosmology tend to be pretty limited <laughs> and fairly high error. So you really need to combine both like these standard candle methods, like the supernovae, as well as standard ruler methods, like the baryon acoustic oscillation and prior knowledge of the CMB, to constrain all of the um, to constrain all of the parameters appropriately. So it's a you know we move into the land of astronomy for a long time was sitting in a telescope or sitting in your office and kind of you know looking at galaxies or predicting things. This pr kind of project in particular is a little bit like trying to detect the Higgs boson in particle physics. It takes a lot of people working on a lot of smaller aspects to be able to make what is basically one measurement. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting you make that analogy because I was thinking the same thing too when you're showing all those detectors 
and all of the, the infrastructure and structure you had to build around the telescope just to support it. I'm thinking, this is a particle physics experiment. It's yeah. gigantic collaboration. It's huge construction. So it's, this is the first s seminar that we've had where we see that connection coming back around with uh, astronomy uh, and a gigantic collaboration like this looking like a high energy physics problem. Yeah, there's definitely, you know, it's not the only trend, but between this and, and say, things like Sloan, projects to, to kind of have the scale to make the measurements, it's been happening for a long time, actually, in space, just because the money required requires big, you know, federal agencies, that kind of thing. You, you're not seeing, like, one university launch a satellite into space, for example, um, because that would be a little ridiculous. But... <laughs> Even on the ground now, I mean, so right now, the HET is 10 meters. It's a pretty big telescope. Um, that's kind of the largest. There's 8 and 10 meter telescopes around, although not very many. Now organizations and, and uh, universities are coming together to build 30 meter telescopes. So that means the primary mirror is 30 meters, which it's kind of the size of, like, a small building or parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, these are billions and billions of dollars, these projects. So, you know, it starts to get very, um, it starts to get a little bit complicated just in terms, I mean, it's always been complicated. The, the idea that there's sort of like one genius scientist in a room doing a science is not, hasn't been true for maybe ever or a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. But when you move to something like 30 meter telescopes and you have hundreds of people on a particular project, it becomes clear that it really is everyone contributing to sort of figure out a variety of pieces. Uh, rather than kind of that singular, brilliant idea happening. Well, do we have any more questions from our our audience here or there in Boston? No. 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 Well, so your your background is experimental and and building and constructing instrumentation. What? What advice do you have for current undergrads who may also find themselves interested in building uh, uh, tech or building instruments uh, to do some of these experiments? What, what are some of the things that, that you would advice that you give to your current undergrads that they're in your, in your lab or that you might share with us? Yeah, so my background, I, my first degree was in physics. Um, and I actually worked in technology Briefly, I sort of worked at a startup um, in Silicon Valley building stuff. And I think that, so, you know, people are interested in different things, but certainly on the tech front, um, I would recommend people just show up and do things. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, trying to get your hands on things, trying to help out with experiments, trying to be involved with, with research projects, you'll very quickly kind of figure out if there are things that you enjoy doing, um, you know, even once you've decided that you want to do something in physics or even in astronomy, there's almost an infinite number of problems to work on. And so it's nice to start getting your hands dirty and figuring out what kind of problems appeal to you. Um, and, you know, it might not be the first or the second or even the fifth person you ask, but, you know, there's a lot of people working on different kind of research projects where they would be happy to tell you what they do um, and happy to get some help and, and to kind of, dig in and, and let you sort of try science out. Um, you know, if, if that's something that you're having trouble getting access to, there's actually also, I think, some really great online tools now um, started actually by a satellite called Stardust that captured, it was doing kind of citizen science by capturing um, dust from the tail of a comet. And that all went online, so you could just go and try to you got to look through their data and, and look for these trails um, from comet dust. And now Galaxy Zoo is kind of the originator of it um, on a larger scale. So now there's a ton of really interesting science experiments that can be done. Like when you have 10 minutes, you can go and look at pictures of giraffes and lions from Africa or count penguins in the Antarctic. Uh, in the Antarctic, right? That's where penguins are. And, um, you know, or do, do galaxy classification. So, you know, I think there's, even if you're not able to kind of get hands-on for, for uh, locally, there's ways that you can kind of start poking around into science and see what you're interested in doing. Um, we don't have an REU here. I think that McDonald Observatory actually 
has in the past, but I didn't hear about it last year, so that's why I'm a little hesitant, but certainly has hired undergraduates. So many of the observatories and, and the, large, um, the large projects actually hire undergraduates, especially in the summer. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard a thousand times, but the research experience for undergraduate programs that run mostly during the summer, although we actually have one in astronomy that runs in Chile, so they're on their seasons are different, so it actually runs from, I think, January to March um, at the Sarah Tololo uh, Inter-American Observatory. So there's a lot of different opportunities where if this is the kind of stuff that you're interested in, you can kind of give it a shot for a few months and maybe get paid a little bit and figure out if it's something that you want to do. Um, you know, it's, it, that being said, one of my undergraduates who was in that picture I showed, I hired him because he worked in his family. Um, they, they run a model toy store. And he was, like, good with his hands. He used to, like, assemble things and, like, clean model trains and paint them and stuff. And I was like, perfect. That's what we do here. And he was like, but really? I thought you did astrophysics. I was like, yeah, and also this. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes surprising things. I think if you follow the things that you're interested in, they sort of lead you to surprising places. Um, and, you know, just that kind of expertise of, you know, taking apart cars or you know, working on, on different kind of models or programming. Um, you know, we use computers pretty much every day, and having that comfort and familiarity really helps uh, as you're interested in going forward. It helps you figure stuff out. So, you know, and I mean, I also, <laughs> full disclosure, I, I, my path was anything but straight ahead. So I went to several universities. I took time off. I worked doing nonprofit fundraising. I worked in Silicon Valley. So... You know, I think that um, sometimes we think that kind of there's only one set of boxes to check and to move forward, but actually even if you change your mind or if something, you know, piques your interest later, um, it's a thing that's well worth kind of looking into. Now, I think I saw on Twitter, you've got a new position that you're going to? I do. I, have a, I just got a faculty position at the University of Washington in Seattle. When does that officially start? Not till September. I... I took a year so I could raise some money and finish some stuff out here. Cool, cool. Yeah. So, excellent. Hopefully you'll have a RU opportunity out there. And we can uh, be aware of that. And Absolutely. Yeah, we're, I'm writing grants right now. I mean, yeah. not right right now, because that would be weird. But <laughs> yeah. It's always grant writing. Always good. It's always grant writing. Well, let's thank our speaker again. This has been fantastic. <laughs> If we have no more questions, then I think that uh, we will bid farewell. Thank you very much, Dr. Tuttle. This has been fantastic. Appreciate your time. And uh, I'll be sending you an email to wrap up sort of the uh, technical side of this uh, later this evening or tomorrow. Great. Thank you so All much, right. everyone. Have a great night. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.